The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Well, welcome to the live audience out there, as well as the live people that are in this room. Uh, you're going to love the title of this message. We're going to have fun this morning, especially having been in ministry. I don't know how many years it is now, 40, 40 some. I don't want to think about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, after 40 some years in ministry, here's, I'm going to title this message one of my favorite things that I hear from Christians. You've heard this. And you have said this yourself. Are you ready? God told me. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> God told me. You've said it. I've said it. Other people have said it. But this is for real. But this is, <laughs> this is for real. We, want, we, we don't want to use it as a Christian excuse for doing what we want to do. Do you know everybody has preferences, Correct. You have likes and dislikes. You go to a restaurant, you don't necessarily pray about, oh, should I get cheese on my cheeseburger or should I just get a plain hamburger? Oh, God, oh, God, give me a sign, <laughs> you know. All right, you have preferences. But my experience has been that in big decisions, you need big guidance. And big decisions and big guidance does not go according to your preferences. God might give you direction that goes contrary to your preferences because he knows the beginning as well as the end and he's looking out for your welfare. So it's very important. I strongly suggest uh, those of you listening, listen to Jason's last message. Uh, I saw one person from uh, Germany uh, listened uh, five times because it's, it's that important. And uh, his, his concept, if you want to make good decisions, you need discernment. Discernment is not a mental function. Discernment is the ability to distinguish this is spirit, this is flesh. This is right, this is wrong. But it's a spiritual function. To the non-spiritual person, that's foolishness. It says so right in Corinthians, right? The spiritual things to the natural man are foolishness. And so thereby the natural man only has the reasoning mind. You have an equipment and an ability to let the Word of God discern you and for you to discern. And if you're going to develop your discernment, you will make better decisions. But discernment is proportional, and this is what Jason covered, is proportional to your fear of the Lord, your real reverence for God. You will make that foundational, your discernment will increase. But if you're doing what they're currently looking into, this progressive Christianity, a lot of the young people, cutting parts of the Bible out, eliminate anything that's inconvenient, and call it freedom. <laughs> All right? So, decision making and loving God is really what I want to talk about, but the God told me. Uh, needs to be based in a real relationship with God and the ability to differentiate or to discern between good and evil regardless of your likes and dislikes. Don't you think that in, if you're seriously seeking God's will that it's not about your likes or dislikes? Because you wouldn't even need God if you just lived by that. Your likes and your dislikes, your preferences. Now, I'm going to give some bad examples. Adam, let's start with the beginning, right? Adam, the most innocent man, sold us down the river, high treason through sin. That was the most innocent man. <laughs> we have Samson in the scriptures, who was the strongest man, demonstrated total weakness. Solomon, who was the wisest man, 
really messed up in the end, didn't he? So making decisions need to be in the fear of the Lord. Once you get outside of the fear of the Lord, you start making decisions just based on what you think or what you would like it to be. Or your reasoning mind telling you, oh, well, that's okay. That should be okay. You know, if you want to know the purpose of a thing, this is why we have scripture. If you want to know the purpose of a thing, don't ask the thing. <laughs> ask the creator. You don't, if you had a VCR and you didn't know how it worked, what would you say? Talk to the VCR? You don't know what a VCR is, okay? <laughs> Any of your technological devices that you have at home. If you don't know how it operates, you look for the manufacturer. You don't talk to it. You don't talk to your laptop and say, what's wrong with you? You crashed. Come on, speak up. It doesn't work that way. You need to go to the manufacturer, right? Now, Jonah, he thought he could outsmart God and run. <laughs> End up getting swallowed by a whale. You know, bad decisions have consequences, don't they? And you know what's sad? In all the years in ministry, I found out that most people have to have a bad, uh, not most, but often on certain key areas, have to have a bad circumstance to learn. But the truth of the gospel and the goodness of God in the fear of the Lord would be that God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. So the problem is on our end, how, how willing are we to go the easy way? And the easy way involves the fear of the Lord and the priority of God and seeking first the kingdom. Getting, I just like it the way the message says it. It just says, you know, uh, like a tea bag would, 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 uh, in the water would displace its flavor. It says, you know, steep yourself in God reality. That's not head knowledge. God reality is spirit to spirit awareness. A no so that comes from the heart, not just the head. That's why when you get saved, if you really have the assurance of your salvation, you say, I know that I know. I know in my knower and I know in my head. How many of you even said the same thing when you got saved? I know that I know. Because that assurance was a spiritual awareness, a spiritual corroboration, a subjective experience that we would call assurance. And you don't have assurance of your salvation because you think you did it right. The assurance of your salvation is in your spirit there is an awareness. We used to do little exercises. We would tell people, close your eyes. Now drop down, put your hand down here just to keep you from doing too much thinking up here, even though we're not throwing this out. And we'd say, all right, now I want you to tell me how it feels down here. Yeah, that's right, feels. Because you, all spiritual awareness is both seeing, hearing, and feeling that informs the mind. So let's see what it, how it informs my mind by saying, how do you feel when you say, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me that I should be called a child of God. Does that feel good? That's assurance. Does it feel bad? You might not be saved. You might have mental assent. It should never feel bad. Assurance is the title deed. Faith is substance. Faith is not a big step in the dark. Faith is the title deed or the assurance, an inner witness, the voice of your spirit saying yes and amen, not just your head. All right? So now I look at, look, look at Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to the Holy Spirit at a time when the glory was poured out and were struck dead as a sign and a symbol. Wow, these people were well-known people, made mistakes. Do you think you could make a bad decision ever? Oh, no, not me. Huh? Could you ever, did you ever make a bad decision? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the good news. No, nope. before the good news, we're going, to, we're going to stay on the problem a little bit. You want the good news, you want the answer, but we've got to magnify the problem so we can apply the solution. Because sometimes people go, that's not me, that must be my neighbor, that must be talking about somebody else. Not me, I don't do that. Mm -mm -mm. See, but we want the Holy Spirit 
to convict and convince you to search your motive. Then the fear of the Lord will be on the ascendancy. Motive, not your opinions. I used to love it when we traveled. We would see some of the most messed up people emotionally, the ones the pastors didn't know what to do with, would say, I've forgiven everybody. And one time we had a couple sitting together, and the pastor just, you know, is going like, this is what I'm saying. This is why I'm turning them over to you and Jennifer, because they've forgiven everybody. They don't have hard feelings toward anybody. And the husband sat next to him very innocently said, well, what about the neighbor when he didn't bring the wheelbarrow back? Well, what about the kids when they didn't come home for Thanksgiving? Well, suddenly there's all this demonic manifestation for someone who's forgiven everybody. Manifestation can be good. <laughs> manifestation shows you who's ruling. Is it the peace of God ruling or is there something else ruling? So manifestation, even bad manifestation, well, what John Wimber used to say, when there's a demonic manifestation, he just said, well, the, the real question is, is it coming or going? <laughs> you know, let's, uh, let's appreciate it. But really, God told me. I've heard that all my life. And here's, here's my, the reason I want to see discernment increase in the body of Christ so desperately. As a pastor... And you've done it with your friends, I'm sure, and other church members. I can bear witness when they say, God told me, and it's really not. It's their preference. It's what they really want. They'll even say, I have a peace about it. The peace is, I got what I want, and I want it now. I want to do it my way and call it God. You know, But if I can discern and understand discernment, Discern other people is to be able to differentiate motive when the motive is not pure. That's the definition of discerning of spirits. To distinguish the source or motive behind a person or situation. And that is a gift of the spirit, but it's also there's daily discernment, which we would call a walk in the spirit, that's required of all of us. But if I can, discernment feels the tip of the iceberg. Like if I were to pray with someone up here right now and we would go through a healing, I could feel in their spirit when they hit a wall and when they release it. If I can feel the tip of the iceberg, how much more responsible are you to know what's going on in you? If I can discern that it's not good, it's not God, how come you don't know? Because all I'm feeling is the tip of the iceberg. The rest of the iceberg's in you. You know what it's telling me? It tells me that selfishness wants what it wants, when it wants it, and preference will win out over the will of God. That's why we need discernment, and that's why we've got to come into a period of a greater appreciation of the fear of the Lord. When you have fear of the Lord is proportional, as Jason said in his message over and over again, and it really stuck. Good decisions require discernment. Good, godly decisions require discernment. And discernment is directly proportional to your fear of the Lord. So when people say, God, there's people who say, God told me, God told me, God told me. And their walk with God is really shallow. And you kind of write it off. Old school was, teach people to hear for God for themselves. And when they say, God told me, don't say nothing. <laughs> and you know what? I don't agree with that totally. I say, if they're in my jurisdiction, I'm going to tell them when I disagree. They, a lot of times they just get mad. Like I, I remember I had that one guy tell me, uh, God told me that you're to be a spiritual father to me, and I know I heard from God. One week later, his wife had a dream that they're supposed to go to a different church. And they, Well, who do you think won? Well, a husband and a wife. Oh, the wife. Okay, she won. But when I says, you know, do whatever God's telling you to do, I agree. But I said, I have to call you on the fact that the two don't jive. As a couple, you need to wrestle with that. And they wouldn't admit that the two didn't jive. Well, see, then you just want what you want. But God didn't change his mind in one or two weeks. God didn't change his mind in two weeks, and suddenly that dream 
overrode what God said. In other words, I don't really know the answer. I just know that that isn't God. One of them wasn't. <laughs> One of them might have been. But when they contradict each other, it doesn't take much to understand. You're doing what you want to do. And I'll tell you what, there is a powerful anointing coming to the church. There is awakening. It's the opposite of being woke. <laughs> woke people need to... What did I see on Facebook? Facebook's not the place to get your best information. Oh, but I saw on Facebook, uh, woke is drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> and how many saw the Matrix? They said, awakening is taking the red pill. <laughs> Reality. I want to see it the way it really, really is. All right. Now, we've seen through scriptures some bad examples. Adam, Solomon, Samson, Jonah, Ananias, and Sapphira. But here's the thing that I want you to tuck away. You're, you, you people are well taught, well trained. The people that follow us uh, have many times they said, here's someone telling us how to do what we knew we were supposed to do. And they'll say, and I've been a Christian 40 years, 30 years, 35 years, okay? So there is a strong emphasis on mature Christians. But even as a mature Christian, I want you to write this scripture down. Ezekiel 14.4. Ezekiel 14.4. I did this at a big prophetic conference and sitting in the audience where the guy was trying to say this and didn't know the scripture. And I said, Ezekiel 14.4. He didn't want to look it up because he goes, how could the person in the audience know that verse? <laughs> I don't know. But eventually he looked it up and goes, you're right, Ezekiel 14.4. He was trying to teach that even a prophetic word, if the heart's not right, God told me, if the heart's not right, you will hear an answer according to the way you want it. Does that make sense? Ezekiel 14, 4 says, If anyone comes to the prophet with an idol in his heart, what's that mean, an idol in the heart? It means there's something you want more than God. If anyone comes to the prophet with an idol in his heart, I, the Lord, will answer according to the multitude of his idols. That doesn't mean God's going to lie to you. It means you're going to hear it through the filter of your flesh. You're going to go with what you want, and you will hear it that way. I've seen more people, God told me, and they really just got what they wanted, and they're using it as a manipulative tool. And you get a bad witness on it, well, I'm old enough now, I'm just gonna, I just tell people on it now. The old school was, just let them go. And I say, tell them, because I want the blood on my hands. You warn them, is a responsible thing to do. They don't have to follow your advice. And in some cases, God knows that the only way they will learn is the hard way the consequence. Remember, he will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. Well, what if the easy way is not the way you choose? Then there will be something redemptive in the consequence. So guess what? There's hope for all of you. Even the ones that make bad decisions. There's hope. And how do I know? David. Let's look at David's life. Learning from David. David certainly wasn't perfect in his decision-making, was he? But I come across a real problematic question. He sinned. He made mistakes. He did things that were wrong. And God was somehow, I want this to be you, somehow he was always able to get David back on track. Why? How? You need to know that, right? I need to know that. How? He messed up. He made lots of mistakes. He made bad decisions. And we're trying to teach you how to make good decisions right from the onset. But nevertheless, what about David? What did he do? And this is part of the solution that we so long to get into Kingdom Life Church people. David loved God. David wanted God's will. 
Not everybody in the church loves God. They love God. They love their job. They love their boat. They love their car. They love their dog. And they have them all on a same even peel, on an even course here. Loving God means supreme. Fear of the Lord means this is the beginning of wisdom, first place. Wisdom that comes from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, full of mercy, good fruit. But there has to be a priority to the love of God. It has to be first place. Seek first the kingdom is to seek first the king. Seek him first, first in priority. Now, David wanted God's will. Uh, another encouraging word is I've seen people who are really kind of anxious about missing God's will. Were you ever like that? Were you ever afraid that you might miss God's will? That's the best thing that you could ever think of. Those are the people that usually don't miss it. God can get you back on track if you did make a bad mistake. There are so many people that could care less about the will of God that if you worry about the will of God, I'm not worried about you. <laughs> You have to be willing to be willing. If, uh, John 7, 17. If anyone wills to do my will, he shall know. The knowledge comes after the intent or motivation of the heart. So that's good news, isn't it? If you're willing to be willing. If you're afraid of missing the will of God, get rid of the fear part, but acknowledge the fact that it's important to you. David wanted the will of God, David screwed up many times, mistakes and sins and, and everything, murder, adultery, serious stuff. But David wanted God's will, and David humbled himself. Isn't that what Jason's message was all about? It's going to require humility to humble yourself, that you're not a know-it-all, you don't have all the right answers, and yes, you do make mistakes, and yes, you've made bad decisions. The question is, are you learning from it? Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up, but hopefully when he gets back up, he doesn't just repeat the same thing over and over and over again. Ask yourself, did you learn from it? Because even in bad decisions have bad consequences, you're supposed to be learning something from that consequence. Use it for instruction. Go, I don't want to do that again. Huh? As opposed to, well, that's just the, oh, here's the excuse that we used to hear when we travel church to church. They blamed it on generational sin. Well, no, I didn't deal with that. I'm just like that. It's generational. I have no control. <laughs> that's called an excuse. God can't heal excuses. You need to repent and say, I don't care if it's generational. I didn't have to enter into it. Nobody forced me. And if I did, I received forgiveness and repent that I entered into something that was generational. And not only that, but I'm going to pray ahead of the devil and I just release forgiveness back to those generations that get engaged in it. I have the grace of God and I've got the reality of Jesus in me. I got the forgiver in me and I release forgiveness to them. Father side, mother side. So be it. Generational, dealing with generational sin, they made it more complicated than they need to. But my greater concern are the ones that use it as an excuse for their dysfunction. <laughs> no, no, don't use generational sin as an excuse. It's, it's too easy to deal with. You forgive. People like excuses, though, because then it makes them flesh feel better. Anyone that comes to the prophet... With an idol in his heart, I, the Lord, will answer according to the idol in the heart. <clears throat> he could do that one with a, a, a prophetic word to where you take the prophetic word and twist it to make it fit what you want. I had a, I had a dream that I had a wonderful dinner at my neighbor's house. I think I'm going to go tell him that God told me that they're to invite me for dinner because I had a dream. And 45 years in ministry or more, I've seen it all. I've seen that kind of thing. That's kind of 
a silly one, but I've seen that in the more serious areas. If someone prophesies you babies or marriages, run. Run for the hills. Well, God told me, you're for me. Well, that's when the other person, if they have an ability to get along with God, say, he didn't tell me that. But I might want that. Oh, if I want that, you're going to enter into preference. You're going to override what God is saying for what you want. Hmm? But again, David humbled himself and repented of his sin. And because of this, David was a man God could lead. So there's hope for all of us, isn't there? It's that beautiful thing called repentance instead of making an excuse. Excuses won't help you. Blaming, oh, that's my favorite one, the blame game. That really should have died as a baby Christian. But when you blame, you're blaming someone else for your predicament. When God is saying, I'm looking at how you respond in that predicament. And as long as you're blaming, you're not healthy. You're in the sin of unforgiveness. Now, the Bible records, <laughs> Jennifer put this in, I didn't have this in my notes, but Jennifer stuck it in there, so she must have wanted you to know this. The Bible records David, nine specific occasions in the scripture when David inquired of the Lord. David's multiple inquiries of the Lord revealed that he was a man of prayer who was always intent on knowing God's will. Is God's will really a priority in your life? Or do you hope that you do what you want to do and hope that God's will puts a stamp of approval on it? That's a, actually a backslidden Christian that wants a stamp of approval. But I look at David and I'm saying, man, he messed up so bad. But this was the main reason because he made inquiries and said, okay, God, you know the one that I like the best and it's hard to get Christians to do it? When David said, I think it's Psalm 19, Search me, O God, for secret faults. Most people are too terrified to ask that one. Oh my goodness, if I ask God to search me for secret faults, that's the stuff I don't know about. He might show me something I don't know about and I don't want to see it. We ran into that all over the place. So you're going to live in denial. Let's we'll see how that works in the long run. <laughs> This scripture blows me away. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. I found David, this is God speaking, under the anointing of the scriptures in the book of Acts. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. What? I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. All your will. You know, this is the part that seems to be confusing to Christians because I hear, I, I can only look at Facebook so often. I'm at the maximum. We got 5,000 friends and some of those people, I don't know who they are. But they say, some people say really weird stuff, you know. But you already know that, that that's not the Bible, Facebook, right? Oh, I, I could feel the peace coming up off, off, off the congregation. Um, <laughs> but... David was a man after my own heart who will do all my will. And David did do all of his will. But the part that seems to be missing, and I see it on Facebook so many things, uh, what sin? God threw it in the sea of forgetfulness. Okay, he's not an amnesiac. He's not having a senior moment. <laughs> the failure to understand spirit, soul, and body is where the problem is, relationally. When God throws something in the sea of forgetfulness, it doesn't cease to exist. If it ceased to exist, David's sins wouldn't be in the Bible. 
for our instruction and reproof. But God says, David is a man after my own heart who will do all my will. In other words, there is a heavenly record here. And I hit people and say, and God forgave me and I forgot about it. Forgive and forget. That's secular. There's no forgiving and forgetting in the head. The heavenly record and the historical record. If you messed up and you asked for forgiveness, it doesn't get erased from your head. Hopefully you remember what you did and said, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> right? It's there for instruction, for reproof, for correction. Learn from it. Don't erase it. But the beauty of the gospel of Jesus, and secular people don't have this. They have to go for counseling and get medicated. Well, really, and that's not even bad because uh, those people that go for secular counseling and get medicated, it keeps them from hurting themselves and other people. So there is a value to it. But I'm talking to the believer. To the believer, there is a heavenly record here that gets erased. How do I know if it's erased? David would have had to have said, I, I killed Uriah. I killed, I committed adultery. And when he remembers those things in his head, down here there's peace. It's erased in your spirit. It's erased in the heavenly record. David was a man after my own heart who will do all my will. To the rational mind, they'd say, really? All your will? I could think of a few things he did that wasn't God's will. But the heavenly record, he's cleansed. This is the beauty of repentance and forgiveness. If we appreciated that, we wouldn't be hiding our sins. We would be exposing to the only one that can eradicate them and wash it out. And when you forget down here, if David were to think of the adultery and think, I don't want to do that again, but down here there's no, <clears throat> down here it's peace. You know what that means? Jesus took your pain, your sorrow, your sin. Jesus in you, the new creation, is the only one. Did you know that there's three scriptures that our friend um, Bob, um, uh, Bill Morford, got all excited about the three double I am's there's 33 I am I am in the scriptures the whole Bible but there's three that are significantly different that he said it's like the word in the Hebrew changed just enough to add an extra emphasis when you say I am I am you're already emphasizing you know truly truly verily verily you're already emphasizing hey this is really important but the other ones are ani ani I am, I am. But he said there's three verses in Isaiah that are anohi, anohi, anohi. And it's like he's saying, you really need to pay attention to this. I'm not only doubling it for emphasis, I am adding exclamation points or whatever, however you want to describe it. And I am, I am your Savior. I am, I am your Savior or Deliverer and nobody can deliver you or save you but me. So much for the many ways to God that our, our young people are falling into. Well, there's a lot of ways to God. Well, that sounds so nice and loving, doesn't it? It's always going to sound nice and loving because Satan doesn't just use blatant evil. He uses something that sounds good. Look at the tree on the fruit. It was good. Christians are suckers for good. That's not God. Now, he goes, all right, are you clear? The Where's the heavenly record? <laughs> this is where you want peace. This is where you want it erased. You don't erase, you don't have Alzheimer or senior moments or any of that stuff. You don't get it erased here. It's when you can picture your sin and have peace. You know it was brought to the cross properly. It was cleansed. It's not something you want to think about all the time. But I watched people give testimonies, even like a Women's Glow Full Gospel businessman. And there were certain people that gave their testimony, but they weren't healed. They were coped 
Well, the world can cope without Jesus. I just got through my husband's illness and I so thank God that I'm giving this testimony and I feel him bleeding on the inside. That is not a testimony. A testimony is when God has transformed that. When God has given you peace. I want to do some demonstrations at the end, so i got to make sure we cover some of this stuff. Is this good so far? You're learning anything? God told you? All right. You hear God speaking to you right now? What's he telling you? La, 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 la. <laughs> That's called denial. No. Listen to this, though, because it's in the Scripture. Um, and if there's hope for David, there's hope for you and I. But I want to do it the right way. I don't want Christians living in denial. You make bad decisions. You make good decisions. There's consequences to those decisions you can learn by, but he'll also take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. Please, do what David did and inquire of the Lord because it eliminates a lot of unnecessary pain. Does anybody, unnecessary trials and tribulations? I like that. Wouldn't you like to have unnecessary trials and tribulations? You don't want unnecessary trials and tribulations, do you? Then deal with stuff quicker. <laughs> Instead of making excuses or telling, saying, God told me. <laughs> Don't put his name on something that you haven't honestly really pursued him on. You just did what you want to do. Call it what it is, selfishness. Now, listen to this. Proverbs 2, verse 1. And this is uh, in 4 to 11 in the... Passion Translation. Just even close your eyes right now. Just drink it in. My child, will you treasure my wisdom? Then and only then will you acquire it. And only if you accept my advice and hide it within will you succeed. For if you keep seeking it like a man would seek for sterling silver, searching in hidden places for cherished treasures, then you will discover the fear of the Lord and find true knowledge of God. Wisdom is a gift from a generous God, and every word he speaks is full of revelation and becomes a fountain of understanding within you. For the Lord has a hidden storehouse of wisdom made accessible to his godly ones. Oh, who's it made accessible to? His godly ones. He becomes your personal bodyguard as you follow his ways, protecting and guarding you as you choose what is right. You make good decisions. Then you will discover all that is just, proper, and fair, and you will be empowered to make right decisions as you walk in your destiny. That's really what we're talking about today. I want you to hear from God, yes. I want you to say, God told me. But I want you to make right decisions so that you walk in your destiny. In other words... Uh, I've seen too many people talk about God's got a dream for me. Yes, he does. But using the word dream a lot of times, it infiltrates into what you want, not necessarily what God wants. Kind of like those that feel like their destiny is to go in a particular direction. Let's use this word. God, instead of having a dream for you, which will pull the cords of your likes and dislikes, Let's say he has an assignment for you. Wouldn't that be a far more responsible thing? God has an assignment for each and every one of us. I like assignment better than a dream. Because I can make believe a lot of stuff in a dream. <laughs> you do things when you dream that you wouldn't do in real life either. You can fantasize something that will actually work contrary to the very thing that God has for you as far as an assignment. When wisdom wins your heart and revelations break through, pleasure enters your soul. If you choose to follow good counsel, divine design will watch over you and understanding will protect you from making poor choices. No. Now, for entertainment, I'm going to give you a scripture from the message. 
For me, anything in the message is entertaining. Listen to this. This is the way God would reprimand us. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 to 22 in the message. When people tell you, try our fortune tellers, consult the spirituals. Why not tap into the spirit world, get in touch with the dead? Tell them, nope, we're going to study the scriptures. People who try the other ways get nowhere, a dead end. Frustrated and famished, they try one thing after another. When nothing works out, they get angry. Cursing first, this thing and that. Looking this way, up and down and sideways, seeing nothing, a blank wall, an empty hole, they end up in the dark with nothing. <laughs> Doom, rebel children, you make plans, but they're not mine. You make deals, but not by my spirit. You pile sin upon sin, one on top of another. You go off to Egypt without so much as asking my opinion. You, go to, you think Pharaoh's going to protect you, expecting to hide out in Egypt? Well, some protection Pharaoh will be. Some hideout, Egypt. They look big and important, true. Official, strategically established in the north and in the south, but there's nothing to them. Anyone stupid enough, well, that's a message for you. Anyone stupid enough to trust them will end up looking stupid. All show, no substance, an embarrassing farce. What's the solution now? Have, we, have you had enough beaten? Have you been beaten up enough? We, have we magnified the pain and the problem? All right, let's move toward the solution. All right. We already know part of it develop humility. Isn't that what David did? Got him out of some pretty bad messes. Humble yourself. Let God search your heart. Develop humility. Isaiah 6 Woe, am I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. When you talk like that, you're a candidate for God to do something gracious to you. Beware of selfish ambition. I've taught it over and over again. Every number of years, I like to teach the I wills. There's the I wills of God because they have set upon me. I will, I will, I will. But then there's Lucifer who said, I will ascend my throne. I will exalt myself above the stars. I will, I will, I will. That's not the one you want, all right? That's selfish ambition. You want or an agenda, all right? But God says, forsake ungodly ways of thinking. Forsake unholy means and unholy alliances. Oh, unholy alliances. Now, what would that be? Well, I've seen it in cases of like church splits and stuff, but I personally, I didn't get engaged in that. But I've seen with other pastor friends certain things. The alliances are, I remember one time I had uh, oh, 250 in the church was the norm. Numbers. <laughs> 60 of those were kids. Uh, <clears throat> I can remember saying uh, five ladies that were friends were all reading a book on cults and brainwashing. And one of the catch words is shame. A cult, they shame you into submission. And I said from the pulpit, and from up here you can see everything, and my church was a dome and it was in a circle, kind of like the way we're set up here, like in a half circle, uh, and you could see everywhere. And I said, oh, I don't even know what I was talking about, but I just said, oh, if you believe that, shame on you. And when I said that word, shame on you, five, the five ladies all went, Be careful who you make alliances with because there are people that only go to you because they think they want you to agree with them. They don't want counsel. They just believe they've got you over the barrel and you will listen to whatever they say. People go for counsel like that all the time. If they hear a rebuttal or questioning their reasoning, they go to someone who doesn't until you can find someone that wants to hear what you have to say. Now, the key is developing humility. 
the trap, and by the way, the book of Judges. How many read the book of Judges? You read the book of Judges. Good. Wow, what a learned group. There's a repetitive theme in the book of Judges that's taking place right now in America. You can find it if you, you could just look up this one phrase, and it's throughout the book of Judges. Every, there was no king. There was no authority. People cast off authority. And people did what was right in their own eyes. That's happening now. People do what's right in their own eyes. And they don't seek authority for an answer. They've cast that off. I can go talk to multitudes of people and get advice, but I'll be the happiest with the ones that agree with me. Not the ones that would give me any kind of a rebuttal. The trap is everyone did what was right in his own eyes. God's trying to develop your conscience that you listen to Him on the inside. Not popular opinion and not just someone who agrees with you. That is not counsel. God saying, and this is a word of the Lord, <laughs> you can't fake devotion to God. Man looks at the outward appearance. You might be able to fool some men, but you don't fool God. You can't fake devotion if he's really number one. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God knows the heart. He knows whether we have integrity or not, and he's looking for wholehearted devotion. All right. I keep saying I'm going to get to the good news. I'm going to get to the good news now. This is a thus saith the Lord for me, and if it's good for me, it's probably good for you too. But I was looking through the scriptures, and I noticed in a footnote that Isaiah chapter 1 through 39 was pretty much geared toward Israel's sin. I've even quoted some of those scriptures. Chapters 1 to 39 was pretty much, you blew it, guys. <laughs> and your sin has brought about a consequence, not fun consequence. Chapter 40, and as far as I'm concerned, God was saying, thus saith the Lord. And, and in the process, we're going back to our studio building right at the, at the time that I feel God is doing that for some reason. Uh, I know some of the reasons. I don't know all the reasons, but I do know this. He says, chapter 40 is, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Speak comfort and cry out to her, for her warfare has ended. Iniquity is pardoned. She's received from the Lord's hand double for the sin. But there's a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be exalted, every mountain hill brought low, the crooked places made straight, and the rough places smooth. For the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. I'm looking for that. We've had a lot of words on Tuesday night to that nature, that God is planning something. And uh, we're going to continue to see that. But we're in a transition or a turning point. We're in the Isaiah 40. But now remember, I said those three scriptures uh, that Bill Morford had in his Bibles that were so different, they're key as far as the Father's heart to people. I am, I am your deliverer or savior, whatever, those words are interchangeable. I am, and there's none besides me that can do that. Isaiah 43, 11. Isaiah 43, 25. I am, I am the one who blots out your transgressions. In other words, I am your forgiver, and no one else can forgive sin. I am, I am, and I mean this, your savior. I am your deliverer. Nobody can deliver you, nobody can save you but me. Say it to the Lord, I am, I am, and I'm firm about this. Get it in your heart, because this is my voice to you. I am, I am, the one that blots out your sin. I'm your forgiver. And then the last one is, I am, I am, the one that comforts you. Isaiah 51, 11. I am, I, is it 51, 11 or 51, 12? I, don't know. I am, I am, the one that comforts you. And what does the New Testament say? 
There's no real genuine comfort. It's all a false comfort unless it's the comfort of the Holy Spirit. If it's not the Holy Spirit, you're padding yourself with flesh. 12, 51, 12. I am, I am. And you know what the scripture says in the New Testament? It says, comfort them with the same comfort whereby you were comforted. You can't even give Holy Spirit comfort to somebody if you don't know how to get it for yourself. You can't give something you don't have. Comfort me, my people. And I'm telling you, this is a season of comforting the people, but this is also the season of separation. It's like the table of the Lord. You know, at the table of the Lord, it says that they, uh, uh, at that last supper, it said, they came around and had communion. And Judas went out and it was dark. The rest of the disciples went to Olivet, the place of illumination and further revelation. So the table of the Lord can be a table of separation as well as a, temp as well as a table of union. Judas, I think the picture language there is clear. Judas went out and it was dark. The disciples went to Olivet, the place of illumination. Where are you going to go in your relationships one toward another in the concept of family? You know, church is not something you go to for a show. Church is not something you go to to attend. Church is to be a family where God's knitting people together from the heart. And there's a no-so that you can't even explain sometimes. You just know it. I feel part of. We've got people that are that are part of us from other states and other countries, but they just know it. It's like finding your tribe. You know, 12 tribes of Israel, but by golly, I'll bet you every one of those tribes knew what tribe they belonged to. <laughs> there's, a, there's an awareness, there's an, uh, an affinity, there's a kinship, there's an attachment. Now, God's saying the preparation is repentance, Look at, look at, if chapter 40 is turning the table and saying your warfare is ended, prepare for the glory of the Lord. What does he tell you to do first? <coughs> Repent. There's going to be a voice in the wilderness crying. What was John the Baptist doing? Repent. Messiah's coming. <coughs> cry out. What shall I cry? All flesh is as grass, but the word of the Lord abides forever. <coughs> In that section, it's repent because there's going to be a highway of holiness. Valleys of depression are going to be raised up. Mountains of pride and obstacles and demonic activity are going to be removed. The crooked places, any crooked places in your life, they're going to be made straight. Any rough places, rough edges are going to be smoothed off. And the glory of the Lord is going to appear. I think that's quite obvious what God's going to expect <coughs> and how he works. <clears throat> the second thing that I saw in Isaiah 40, because he's really speaking through Isaiah 40, was, <clears throat> I'm not asking for your opinions or arguments. <clears throat> Thank you. I don't care about your progressive thinking. You know what, the progressive thinking eventually will lead to no standards whatsoever. First, it's just convenience. Oh. <clears throat> and it seeks in in the, in the way of opinions that sound compassionate. Oh, why shouldn't those two sinning people enjoy love? like everyone else. Doesn't that sound loving? It doesn't mention the sin. It just says, those two sinning people, don't they deserve love like everybody else? That's the way it comes in. <clears throat> Good, but not God. God deals with sin. Good doesn't deal with sin. Good rationalizes, philosophizes. But God's saying this, <clears throat> Where to decree, where to cry out, it's not opinions, but the word of the Lord. You have an obligation to speak the word of God. And if that confronts, so be it. 
Jesus was very confrontive because the Word of God stands. And that's what needs to be voiced. Not progressive Christianity that waters down Christianity to be comfortable in sin. Now, as you look at Isaiah 40, and I see the layout of how God would turn this around, and most of you should be really getting into that chapter and just looking at it, because it's a turning point, and we're at a turning point. We're not there yet, but we're at, clearly at a turning point. I want to make ready of people prepared to know that you were taught properly what to do in light of what's about to happen. And <clears throat> after that, there's the voice in verses 9. And God used this scripture many years ago when uh, I was reluctant, but God wanted me to go on the radio in uh, Pennsylvania. I didn't really want to do a radio program. I didn't, that wasn't my preference. But God gave this verse, and it spoke to my spirit, and I said, whatever you want, God, I'll do it. He says, get up. Where is it? Cry out. What shall I cry? Well, grass withers, the word of the Lord stands forever. But in verse 9, <clears throat> Zion, you who bring good news, get up into a high mountain. Lift up your voice with strength and say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. God used that scripture to tell me, lift up your, it was radio at that time, lift up your voice with strength and say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. And I had general overseers from denominations that never heard of me or my church, all of a sudden because of that radio they started saying, I need you to do this and I need you to do that and I want you to do this and I want you to do that. All because I was obedient to do something I didn't feel like doing. Because in those days you had to put it on a cassette, you had to sit in a room, talk to a microphone, then take it to the studio and they would play that little cassette and stick it in the machine. And it was like, I didn't, I didn't li I liked talking to an audience, I didn't like talking to this little, this little microphone all by myself in the room. But God used it. Get up into a high mountain, lift up your voice with strength, and say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. You know, our Sunday mornings are being played in Middle East TV. We're actually, I am actually declaring the word of God to the cities of Judah. Behold your God. Right? Isn't that interesting? So that's the next phase. We're going to lift up our voices. Actually, when we go back to the other studio, too, those Sunday mornings, we'll go on SIDS Network, which is going to Middle East. Now, we have YouTube and Facebook. I think they're kind of unreliable and can be problematic. So I'm not putting a lot of confidence. We will be, in, even in the studio, right, Jason? We will be doing live on Facebook, live on YouTube, but the more important platform at this point would be Sid's program for Sunday mornings. Now, <clears throat> lift up your voice, be not afraid. God's going to manifest. The scripture goes on. Strength's going to rule. His rewarders will be with him. And he's going to give power to the weak. And the young men will utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and they will mount up with wings as eagles. That's what we're doing on Tuesday. No set pattern, except we're learning that we can at least tarry an hour. We can at least sit still long enough to honor God. <clears throat> whether you hear anything or not, whether you participate or not, you honored God. Now, I want to do, uh, before we close... <clears throat> I want to do a little uh, activation. Do I have a volunteer that'll come up here? Christy, thank you for volunteering. She didn't really raise her hand. But I want to, I want to do this. <clears throat> How to make a decision and be neutral. Okay? Do you have any decisions that you're looking forward to in the future? Sure. Okay. Take that decision and think about it. Put your hand down here, because down in the spirit. Okay, um, we'll say, yes, God, I will do it. No, God, I won't. And you present it before him. And the one that you get the most peace on 
All right, I'll go. No, I won't. Whatever the decision is. Okay, so for right now I want you to place the positive before the Lord first, okay? How does it feel? Kind of... Okay. Kind of... Even nothing yeah. is okay. All right. Uh, no, I won't. How does that feel? I'm kind of open to both of them. What, do you, what if you just have peace? Then, then that's a, like a yellow light. <laughs> Red light means don't do it. Green light's good. Mm -hmm. Yellow light means hold your heart open to that. Ooh, there's a, you got a nice unction on that. Hold your heart open. Hmm? Wait upon the Lord. That honors God. One of the first things he told me is, just because you don't get an immediate anything in your prayer time, scripture, feel like God's speaking something, you honored me by just being open and waiting upon me. And it cultivates something superior than an answer. And it cultivates the attitude of the heart that I want what he wants. So you can still pursue it. Red light, green light, yellow light. And everybody can do that. What it does is it teach you to be neutral. If I am receiving forgiveness, if there's any non-neutrality in me, because you have preference, right? Every decision, don't tell me you don't have a preference. But you're going to die to your preference and surrender to obedience. Is that a good idea? Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Very good. It's not that hard, is it, really? It's just a question of what God's looking for is honesty between you and Him. And not excuses. So, Father, I want to pray for the listening audience that's watching by YouTube, Facebook, Sid, what, what can't be said, this room doesn't qualify. Uh, but anybody watching by YouTube or Facebook, <clears throat> I want to pray that you die right now to any seducing spirit that is drawing you in a direction. You know what a seducing spirit feels like? It feels like I feel like I'm linked, but I don't want to be linked. I feel like I'm connected, but I don't feel like it's right. And you can be connected to a person, place, or thing. Person, place, or thing. And I'm asking God to break any seducing spirit. And I receive forgiveness for giving ground to a seducing spirit. Jennifer says I need to go slower. All right. Close your eyes. You're watching by YouTube. You're watching by video. You say, God, if there's something that I'm, un that I'm attached to in an unhealthy way, that I feel like I can't just quit, I want it, and I don't feel like I can just let it go. Any addictive behavior, any person, place, or thing that's an unhealthy attachment. I receive forgiveness and I sever that attachment. Now keep in mind when you sever an attachment, uh, the people, place, or thing will pop up. <laughs> and if it's a person, they will try to reattach. They will sense that was gone. Remember that time I broke a soul tie with a woman and her mother? She's saying, my husband and I should be making these decisions, not my mother. We broke it in my office, and my phone rang in the office and said, is my daughter there? And she got the phone and said, why did you divorce me? Interesting choice of words, isn't it? She broke a soul tie, an unhealthy relationship between mother and daughter, and said, why did you divorce me? She could feel it in the spirit. You're to be your own individual. Okay, 
I'm going to drop down to your spirit. Anything that I'm attached to in an unhealthy way, person, place, or thing, I receive forgiveness. Could be stuff you watch on Facebook. Could be fantasizing. Could be addictive habits. But I receive forgiveness for that attachment. I sever that relationship. Now here's an important part. I offer... <laughs> Jennifer, wanted, I think, wants to do this. I offer my emotions back to God. My emotions belong to God. I was bought with a price. Mind, will, and emotions, all three belong to God. Not two out of the three, but all three belong to God. When I prayed with a young girl who was in a bad relationship, pastor's daughter, she said, I know God did it because the pull isn't there anymore. And I don't have to hate him. You know, if you're in a love-hate relationship, you want it and then you get mad that you don't have it. It can be a love-hate relationship. And she thought the only way she could break up with him was to hate him until the soul tie was broken. And she says, I don't feel the pull anymore. You're free. And then you don't have to hate. That's not a solution. How to be neutral. We would learn to be neutral. We would make better decisions and our discernment would increase. Father, seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit and increase in the days ahead as we are about to turn a corner. We're at a turning point. And God is preparing a highway. And He's going to start resolving those things that are in the way. They're in the way of us fulfilling our assignment and, walk, and serving the purposes of God for our generation, just as David served the purposes of God for his generation. With all of his bad decisions, God got him back on track. With all your bad decisions, God can get you back on track. Isn't that good news? That's the good news. You who bring good news, get up into a high hill. Lift up your voice with strength and say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. He's there for you. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.